Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Drew Johnson. And I'm from, from Eris, uh, VP of Engineering at Eris. Anybody in here ever heard of Eris? I doubt it. Okay, very good. Uh, so at Eris, uh, we provide um, IoT connectivity as a service, uh, cloud-based IoT application and analytics platform as a service, and then really our most recent offering is our connected vehicle, uh, uh, our telematics service, service provider services. So, um, and we, we provide our services uh, in a variety of ways, we have a, a self-service platform, uh, Neo. We call Neo. So if you go to neo.aris.com, you can um, actually sign up, become a customer, uh, order Sims, and uh, have them in your hands within 24 hours. Uh, you can get access to some of our other services, other than our connected connected car platform. Uh, direct sales. Uh, we have direct sales primarily in the United States, but also in, in Europe and uh, pretty soon in, in Asia, uh, distributors, partners, and actually MNOs. So we provide our capabilities to other operators. We have, other, we have operator customers in the US, uh, in Asia, and um, very soon in other parts of the world. So uh, we're really lucky at Eris. Uh, you can see that has been our growth over the last few years. So business is good in the Internet of Things. I love being in the Internet of Things. It's really a fantastic domain. Uh, but we think of, of the Internet of Things right now as kind of IoT 1.0. And we're, we're really starting to think about um, what does IoT 2.0 look like. And that's actually really what most of this presentation is about. But if we think about IoT 1.0, uh, really success for operators is how do you make money at really low ARPUs? And we, we know that uh, we're actually making money, but we also know that many operators who are in the IoT space don't make money. They do not make money. Um, and in order to make money and be successful in IoT 1.0, what's been necessary is really large amounts of automation and self-service uh, and then uh, really eliminating margin stacking. So if you think about kind of traditional operators and all of the, the kind of vendors and suppliers that they pay, um, that's a big problem of why they actually don't make profit out of their Internet of Things business. And then from an enterprise perspective, you know, if we think about kind of 1.0, they've really gone after uh, some key use cases and you know, we think about the Internet of Things, uh, you know, there is a use case for connecting every single thing that we see. That's clear. And you, know, you hear that from everybody, everybody's numbers. Um, it's really all about, is the ROI there? So can you get, uh, typically the ROI gets there if you get the, if you get the cost down low enough. Uh, and then, one of the things I'm going to talk about today is the difference between IoT first and an IoT after kind of approach. So IoT after has been fine up to now and in many of these use cases, but uh, par part of what we are seeing and saying is uh, enterprises are going to need to move to an IoT first approach. So if we look at the, at the operator space really quickly, this is, um, you know, as we kind of talk to operators, around the country and, and, and we run and, and offer our services ourselves. This is how we kind of see the, the maturity scale for operators. Normally they've started with connectivity platform um, and you know we have our airport connectivity platform is, is one of, of many and it's rebranded as, as command center and, and others for, for different operators. Then um, then they start kind of bringing up and recognizing that they have to go after um, IoT in different ways than their consumer business. So they, they bring up sales channels and go after developers and, and go after uh, like self-serve or small business. That's like our Neo channel so that actually you don't have a salesperson talking to a customer. That's actually really key. 
they realize that they have to have a global offering because most of, of the Internet of Things is actually, um, you know, most customers are actually looking for, for pretty global offerings. And then eventually, if you really want to make money as an operator, you start looking at going after vertical markets uh, and actually having your own branded solutions in some areas or enabling a third-party ecosystem so that you can revenue share uh, on some of those solutions. So this is kind of maturity model for operators. So then if we turn back to more like enterprises. So enterprises, uh, we really think of, you know, it's, it's sort of like, you know, you had one, web 1.0 and then web 2.0, which kind of really changed things. You had kind of in the mobile space, you had people repurposing uh, what they were doing for, uh, for the fixed internet. Uh, and then you had companies really coming along and doing mobile first. And so that's kind of what we're seeing and saying in the, uh, in the Internet of Things. So you kind of have enterprises who have started with either IoT add-on, so they've taken an existing product and they've kind of bolted on some connectivity, or maybe they're doing IoT built-in, again, kind of taking an existing product and sort of embedding connectivity, which is pretty good. But then real winners are going to have to move to this IoT-first approach where they kind of really reimagine their product uh, from the ground up with IoT. So if we look a little more, more carefully at, at what that means, uh, IoT after, uh, as we described, a lot of it is about you know, really being focused on kind of a single use case, uh, typically a single group in the company is really kind of focused and benefits on adding connectivity to the product. If you compare that with an IoT first approach, now you've got kind of embedded, ubiquitous, cradle to grave connectivity. Um, every group in the company is really kind of thinking through how that's going to benefit them. And uh, they get to, the company gets to really know the supply chain, they get to know the, the customers, first and second customers. Like if you think about a, a car, for example, there are actually multiple customers. Today, car companies really have no idea who, who the second owner of that vehicle is. Um, you get to move from reactive customer support to, to proactive customer support. Um, you get to, and you get to actually learn how to improve the product. So these are things that um, they're really revolutionary for most products that have been, uh, you know, sold and, and often the, the creator of that product actually doesn't even know in, in any great detail how the product actually gets used. Um, key thing is that the, the user uh, interactions actually get reimagined. And we'll, we'll, we'll take a look at, uh, at a use case in a second that, that is is an example of, of probably early IoT first uh, design. And the, 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 the product needs to be smart. Part of this whole thing is that um, it could actually uh, do things automatically rather than even having a, a reimagined or, or better user interface, but just do things automatically. And then capitalizing on the data opportunities of Really the, you know, again, if, if we think about where we are in the evolution of the, of the Internet of Things, there's still a lot of the solutions that are stovepipes of data. And later on, as, as IoT matures, some of this data can be brought together. Then that's where we'll get kind of the next level of, of value out of Internet of Things. So if we take a look at uh, one kind of uh, product that's a, a probably a pretty decent uh, example of some early IoT first thinking is Nest. And I'd, I'd love to say they're actually a customer of ours, but they're not. Um, but I do think that they're a good example. So if you look at, at kind of Nest, they said, you know, it's, it's really designers coming out of Apple. They said that they could go get consumers to pay a lot of money for a uh, redesigned thermostat, connected thermostat, uh, based on great user experience and kind of a, a green approach. 
uh, and they're very successful at that. What they, what they also found, though, was that they could get a ton of revenue out of connecting consumers with the power companies. And actually, if you think about where a lot of the, the value of Nest has come, it's actually from that uh, use case rather than, than anything to do with the, the actual initial purchase. It's actually a gateway to other devices in the home. And uh, so they've had this strategy and, and, they're, and they're building other devices, but then there's also an ecosystem that's actually building around Nest on something as simple as uh, a way. So the, val the, the, the fact that they can determine a way is really uh, valuable to others who are building other products. And you can see, for example, here on, on app downloads, just how you know, Honeywell, who owned that market, uh, is getting killed right now in the, in the connected thermostat space, and they're busy trying to catch up. Another uh, product area is sleep apnea device. This is a, a customer of ours. So uh, they initially connected their sleep apnea device uh, in order to guarantee that they could get money from the insurance company so they could prove that the, the consumer was actually using the device. Uh, what they found, though, was that once they connected their device, they now all of a sudden that the, the, both the doctors and the patients could get immediate feedback from the previous night on, on their actual sleep behaviors. So that actually increased the utilization of their device from like 60% to 80%. They got way better inventory management. They actually know where their sleep apnea devices are going now. They, didn't, they had no idea before. Uh, they get way better customer understanding. Their business has actually increased by 40%. And if you look at their, their, uh, their competition right now, they're busy trying to kind of bolt on some connectivity to their device to try to catch up. So here's just an example of, you know, for them, this is distribution over, you know, some number of, of months uh, last year. Again, they had no idea where their devices were going before they actually had them connected and, and could start understanding that. Then if we look at the, the connected vehicle space, um, the, the thing that's happening there is that um, OEMs actually are, are, are pretty conservative. Um, and, but it's been very interesting, even over the time that I've been at Eris. So in 2011, we would have these conversations with OEMs. They'd say, hey, focus on, on this infotainment space. Um, you know, when it comes to, to data and collecting data on usage, you know, our, our company would never share data with, with uh, other companies. Then, you know, a couple, in 2013, they started saying, oh, well, you know, sharing data might be, might be valuable. Maybe we could do this usage-based insurance thing. Can you help us share that data in a really secure way? Uh, and then this last year, uh, as we've kind of rolled out our connected vehicle platform and, and gotten our first customers in Japan, now they're saying, hey, Forget about infotainment, there's Apple CarPlay and all that kind of stuff, but you know, can you help us track our vehicles through the supply chain? Uh, can you help us update the firmware? All the kind of more IoT first kinds of, of activities. So promising in that way. Just, I just got a couple more slides, I know I'm running out of time. Um, this is really kind of IoT anatomy, so if we think about IoT first and how can Eris help, uh, this is, these are the offerings we have. Devices, we actually don't sell any devices, but we have our own SIM and some SIM technologies and, and software agent. Uh, for connectivity platform, we have Airport and actually our own AirCore core network that uh, you know, is cloud-based. We have AirCloud application enablement platform, Airvoyance analytics, and then in the application uh, kind of visualization, we have this App Express, and then uh, really security offerings throughout. Security is, of course, really, really big in Internet of Things, and security has to be addressed at every single layer uh, in the Internet of Things. And last slide that, that I have is actually, if we think about the areas that we are really looking to, to kind of partner, love to partner with people more on the, on the device side. Uh, and then here in the the actual visualization layer, 
we really need uh, actually some open source uh, platform at that layer that allows, we, we've done kind of a, an initial stab at this of a bit, having a platform where you can drag widgets in and, and you know, connect up to our, to our platform. But we'd love to work with others on kind of a, um, a more ubiquitous kind of, kind of platform there that could, could really span multiple uh, data platforms. So love to talk to, to anybody who's interested in that. That's it.